This week has been filled with talk about new CPU and GPU developments that could impact video game streamers and the like using standard PC broadcast setups. But I've spent this week instead playing with this little box right here, which is its own streaming system mainly designed for people who aren't doing game streaming in a nice, compact, and newbie friendly package, but at a fairly high price. This is the new Pearl Nano from Epifan, a company I've covered off and on over the years for their quick and easy to use capture products and streaming products, including their HDMI and SDI capture cards, which I still use off and on even today. I'm Evil's Vox, the stream professor, and I've previously covered the original Epifan Pearl back when I had far less experience, mind you, and they've since released the Pearl 2 and the Pearl Mini, which have been kind of big flagship broadcast tools. The Nano, on the other hand, rounds off their lineup with an entry-level product that is more limited in capabilities, but also a tad more accessible. And I appreciate this approach of using a newbie product as the end of the product stack rather than the beginning as Blackmagic did with the A10 Mini Pro line because it seems like every time someone in their engineering department thought of a new feature, suddenly they released a new A10 Mini Pro product, which meant that if you already bought one and you wanted one of those features, you'd have to try to sell it off or fork out more money to upgrade, whereas they start out with Epifan, they started out with the big boy and then slowly slimmed down to try to reach a different price and needs points, which I think is valuable. Taking a quick physical overview, this metal chassis is small and lightweight, but it'll take a kick. Uh, it's about the size of a book, uh, but a little bit heavier. On the front you have a 3.5mm headphone jack, SD card slot, tiny little LCD, LCD display, this is not touch, uh, navigation buttons, and dedicated stream and record buttons. The back features lots of I.O. goodness. A locking 12 volt DC power connector. It is able to be powered over Power Over Ethernet Plus as well, by the way. A Kensington lock, USB 3.0 Type A port, HDMI out for the monitoring and control interface or the final mix, if you want to use it directly with a keyboard and mouse. Gigabit Ethernet, which supports PoE Plus, as mentioned. SDI input, HDMI input, and lag-free HDMI pass-through for that input. RCA audio input and a pair of XLR inputs. The bottom features a removable cover to access the M.2 SATA SSD drive slot. It won't accept NVMe SSDs, but it will take SATA. Keep in mind that using an SSD here disables the front SD card slot, which I find a little silly of a sacrifice personally, but you can load it up with a big one or two terabyte drive to keep a running archive of all of the shows or lectures being made with this thing for a long time. There's also mounting threads on the bottom, so you can just rig this up just about anywhere. Currently, the HDMI and SDI inputs max out at a 1080p60 format, but Epifan's original marketing says that these can be upgraded to 4K with an update later on. We'll see. I personally get annoyed at the lack of 4K support on new devices in 2021, but in the real world, most people aren't trying 4K broadcasts, and even Blackmagic's A10 Mini Pro line is all 1080p. The USB port supports USB hubs and connecting multiple devices, such as a keyboard and mouse, to use this directly as a stream computer, or even USB microphones too. It does not work with UBC uh, capture cards or webcams over USB, however, unfortunately. The XLR inputs run at line level, so it won't work for connecting microphones directly. It's designed to accept a final mix out of a recorder or mixer at normal line level. Testing the HDMI inputs uh, with the time sleuth to measure latency, the HDMI pass-through does in fact appear to stay real-time, with adding no additional lag to the HDMI feed, while the normal HDMI out for the final mix adds almost exactly a frame of lag, which is to be expected with the mixing and the frame buffer involved there. So. Hey, this box is great for creating interviews or podcasts. You know where those interviews do best? My own streaming service called Nebula. I've built this with my creator friends to house the extended cuts of videos that wouldn't perform as well on YouTube and deliver them in higher quality without ads. And with it, we've partnered with CuriosityStream. Nebula features YouTube's top education creators such as Legal Eagle, Thomas Frank, and Low Spec Gamer. There is the nearly two hour extended cut of my interview with Mr. Greggles from this week up there as well. Curiosity Stream saw what we were doing for educational content and wanted to partner up. We've worked out a deal where if you sign up for Curiosity Stream with the link in the description down below, you not only get access to Curiosity Stream and their library of thousands of educational and documentary content, but you get access to Nebula for free for the entire duration of your subscription to Curiosity Stream. 
So you get all of this extra YouTube content on top of the awesome Curiosity Stream content. For a limited time, Curiosity Stream is running a discount on their annual plan for 26% off, making it less than $15 per year for both Nebula and Curiosity Stream, which is pretty bonkers. While you're there, check out Pizza, a love story. I don't really feel like I need to say more. It's about pizza. Everybody loves pizza. I wish I could order me a pizza right now. But you should go to curiositystream.com slash epos to order you the best deal in streaming and get access to both sites for under $15 per year. Again, that's curiositystream.com slash epos. It's crazy. Just do it. In terms of streaming, this box supports RTMP, HLS, which you can now send to YouTube, by the way, and even SRT, both in and out. So while obviously you can use this box as an endpoint, even with an HDMI video switcher like the original ATEM Mini, to broadcast up to YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, or any other video site, you can also use it to send to other streaming setups as well with SRT, Secure Reliable Transport. This is a secure way to package up high quality video and audio to add into other streams or broadcasts, kind of like NDI, but it can go over the internet as well. With SRT, you can send the Nano's feed to another big Pearl box or to a whole streaming PC setup, whatever. It's not something you'd really use to just beam up to a normal public facing video platform, just between nodes in a greater broadcast setup. That's where the value proposition for the Nano really shines. This box can power all kinds of broadcasts that you'd never even think about. With its cloud management capabilities, you could package it up with a camera and audio and mail it off to interview guests or remote teachers to fairly easily just plug it in and you control the broadcast from there remotely. It's fairly idiot proof other than audio. You might need to send someone to pop in and sort out the audio setup, but that's detached from this box specifically. Well, until you attach it. Plus, it can power any number of custom streaming solutions. They support Panopto and Kaltura right out of the box. Yes, I know I probably said both of those wrong. Even with automated scheduled streaming, which are used for corporate broadcasts, education, and so on. And they have an API where you can build out and seamlessly integrate this into just about any streaming setup or website with an easy, low upkeep, total custom solution here. They also have support for Crestron AV systems for businesses too. This kind of total integration into whatever solution you wish to build out is where the Nano stands above, say, slapping a laptop, some capture cards, and OBS together, especially when it comes to support. Basic training or on-site instructions can keep an education or corporate setup using one of these running for a very long time with minimal support. Whereas throwing an OBS PC together as, you know, with cheap components is something you'll be playing tech support with for basically all time. Plus, you can either set it up to connect remotely with the UPnP auto setup with DHCP and all of that from the box itself if the network you send it to supports it, or via the cloud service, so it's pretty foolproof overall. That being said, there are limitations to the allowed workflow for this device. You can only configure one stream layout, or channel as they call it, to be used at a time. This is a huge limitation that even just having a second one, two total, would alleviate pain points for screencasts, lectures, conference presentations, etc. that they may run into. Again, you can just upgrade to the Pearl Mini or two for this, but it feels like a terrible kneecap to this product. To change layouts, you have to completely swap everything over, and that cannot be done while recording or streaming, even though it can be on the bigger products. You also have limited capabilities in terms of actually configuring the layout. Graphics and picture-in-picture -picture modes are supported via the different video inputs and the media manager, or even by bringing in outside RTSP or SRT streams, but you don't get the granular transform tools or placement that you would on the Pearl 2, for example. Size of sources is determined by scaling them to a lower resolution. You can still crop and adjust position, but not dynamically scale, which makes it difficult or impossible to use finely tuned layout visuals versus just a basic background and lower third. There's also no chroma key support that I can tell. You do get the flexibility to mix inputs across HDMI, SDI, and RTSP or SRT streams, as well as audio from HDMI, SDI, RCA, or XLR, and USB, which is neat. USB microphone support will save some of the setup hassle for mailing this off to an interviewee as well. Recordings can be managed quite competently. You either record directly to the SD card or the SSD, but not both. Uh, from there, you can configure automatic file uploads to network storage locations or Epifan Cloud or uh, the direct uploading to Kaltura or Panopto. You can copy files to a USB drive or access the Nano via FTP. Plus, you can directly download the files through your web browser from the management interface. So, 
that's handy as well. The streams and recordings themselves are saved in the same quality, so you cannot run a high bitrate local recording with a low bitrate web stream, unfortunately. But you can pass either of the HDMI outputs to a dedicated video recorder. The streams rely on the included hardware H.264 encoder with basic configuration options uh, such as encoder profile, which should almost always be set to high, resolution, keyframe interval, frame rate, and bitrate, along with AAC, PCM, or MP3 audio support and bitrate for that as well. Quality-wise, it's a hardware H.264 encoder, so it won't keep up with the current game streaming expectations of X.264 Slow or Turing NVENC on a high-end gaming PC, but it's passable for what it is. While high-action content such as 60fps gaming may end up a little blocky, slower-paced lectures, screencasts, conferences, or interviews would still look awesome on this thing. Heck, with the SDI input, I can configure my big Ursa Mini Pro Cinema camera to run into this for a sick little, like, interview presentation setup. By the way, if you notice a weird jitter to my webcam in some of these tests, I was experimenting with sending my webcam from my PC via OBS with SRT to the Nano. It had a weird frame out of order desync issue of some sort. SRT support is still quite young in OBS, so I'm just gonna... Blame it on that somehow. While the Pearl Nano is a tad pricey in the enthusiast game streamer category, for the more professional market it's aimed at, it's not all that expensive, and I think it will enable some really cool broadcast performance, most of which you will never see because it'll be so hidden and integrated into their sites. For more streaming tech reviews like this one, get subscribed and join me on Discord at discord.gg slash evosfox. We'll meet again.